Staff Sergeant. And can you tell me uh, where exactly you serve? You know, sorry, from basic training up and through the, the, the I, last day. I started basic in Fort Dix, New Jersey. I went to an advanced school at Fort Eustis, Virginia. From there, I went to Fort Sill, uh, Oklahoma, and then Vietnam. After Vietnam, I went to Fort Carson, Colorado. And from Fort Carson, I went to Fort Wadsworth, New York. And then I was discharged. Then I went back in in 1974. I was started at uh, Fort Leonardwood, Missouri. From Missouri, I went to Fort Polk, Louisiana. From Fort, Fort, Fort Polk, Louisiana, I went to Fort Eustis, Virginia. And then back to Fort Sill, Oklahoma. From there, I went to Fort Campbell, Kentucky. And from there, I went to Hawaii. Wow. <laughs> you've, you've been to uh, a lot of different places. Yeah, I have. Uh, is there a favorite place that you were at uh, at a ball? Not probably Hawaii. Hawaii. <laughs> How long were you stationed in Hawaii? I was stationed in Hawaii from February 1976 until June 1980. So going back to before you went to Vietnam, you told me that you enlisted. I was enlisted. Now, where were you living at the time that you were enlisted? In New Britain, Connecticut. New Britain. And um, why, did, why did you decide to, uh, to enlist? Well, the country was at war, and I felt my, my father was military, and my grandfather was military, so I decided I wanted to join. I wasn't, I wasn't ready for college at that time. Mm -hmm. um, you said you, your, your father and grandfather were in the military. Where, where did they serve? Uh, my grand, my father served in Italy during World War II, wow. and I'm really not sure where my grandfather served. Were they both in the army? Yes. Now, why did you pick the uh, the branch of service that you joined? I felt they had more opportunities for education and different jobs. Mm -hmm. Now, do you recall your first days in service? I certainly do. Can you tell me uh, what it felt like? Uh, you know, what? I wondered why I even joined. Uh, I was shipped down to Fort Dix, uh, New Jersey from the uh, entrance uh, examination place in New Haven. And it was like undescribable how they treated you the first three days. I mean, everything was hurry up and go, hurry up and stand in line. It was busy 24-7 for three days. Yeah. Now, could you tell me a little bit about your, your boot camp and your training experiences? Well, <clears throat> at that time, uh, and, and as it is probably today, which I really don't know, but at that time, uh, of course, we were in a conflict in Vietnam, so we had, uh, I think, two extra weeks of training or hand-to-hand uh, -hand combat. We had like 40 hours of that. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and also at that time, they were switching over from the M14 rifle to the M16. Okay. So we had to train with and qualify with both weapons, actually. So you had to qualify uh, on the older weapon first and then re-qualify? Yes. Did you see any, did you feel any differences between the weapons? Oh, the definitely. The, the M14 weighed 14 pounds loaded. And the M16 weighed seven something. It was like half the weight. Yeah. How was it? The was the accuracy much better? On, on I th I think it was. I mean, some people say it jammed up a lot, but uh -huh. I didn't have a problem. But when I was in Vietnam, I carried a 45 pistol because I was a crew member. I was a flight engineer. Okay. So you had, you had the standard uh, side issued 45, the Colt. Yes. Nice. That was the M1911. So, do you remember your instructors from uh, training? Uh, I yes, I do. Uh, I, 
I can't recall his name right now, but I do remember him. Now, with all the, all the training and, and, and stuff, Bob, how did you get through it? Through uh, basic training and all that? Well, basic, really, we didn't have time to think about it. Uh, but uh, I got through it okay. There were some people that didn't. Some of them went a wall. Yeah. You know, some of them just couldn't hack it. But I, I went through no problem. Now, the, the, the guys that you uh, went through basic with, were, were all of them enlisted guys or were some of them drafted? No, we had quite a few draftees. Yeah. Now, moving on here, Bob, you said you served in uh, Vietnam. Where exactly did you, did you go? I finally ended up in uh, uh, Bearcat, which was a Thai-owned complex. And, and it was uh, north of the Long Bend, I don't know, 25, 30 miles. Do you remember uh, what else, any, anything else in particular stuck out of your mind when you first arrived in the country? What, what was going through your mind? Well, we got off the plane, and uh, you know, I noticed on the way over on, on the aircraft, uh, each stop we made from California to uh, uh, Hawaii, and then the Philippines, and then Vietnam. At each stop, the stewardesses were replaced, and they seemed to have gotten older as we got over there. <laughs> <laughs> and I noticed that when we did land in Vietnam, we were put on buses with uh, fencing on all the windows, and kind of woke me up, you know, let me realize where I actually was, and a stench of uh, uh, human fecal material in the air. I mean, it's unrealistic. Un, uh, you know, something you can't forget. Now, could you tell me about what your job assignment was? When you yeah. I started off uh, initially for the first few weeks as a, as a mechanic on a CH-47A Chinook. Uh -huh. And then uh, I was placed in a crew chief slot, and from there I went to a flight engineer, and I served mostly uh, as a flight engineer. Can you tell me a little bit more about about you know your different positions, what the responsibilities were? Well, each? yeah, sure. As a mechanic, we were assigned different aircraft as they needed maintenance, and uh, we did uh, normal normal maintenance at, at that level. Uh, oil changes, engine changes, rotor blade changes, transmission work. Uh, we had a problem getting a lot of parts at that time too. So we flew on conditions actually that you would never fly on in, in the United States. We had no choice. And then as a crew chief, you're responsible for one particular aircraft maintenance. And as a flight engineer, you were in charge of the crew. Mm -hmm. And you also were responsible for all the maintenance and made sure that it got done properly. Now, back in, in the uh, United States, they trained you extensively on, you know, on uh, the mechanics of the Chinook beforehand? Yes, I was in school at Fort Eustis for 16 weeks, four months. What was that like? It was, uh, it was interesting. Uh, I, I have a mechanical background anyhow, but uh, it was, you know, uh, five days a week, 40 hours a week, and usually had the weekend off. It was, uh, there was homework, and it, it was intense. Yeah. It moved quickly. But that wasn't the only job I had uh, in the military. What other uh, positions did you, did you have in the military? I was a criminal investigator for the Navy at Barbers Point, Hawaii. That, uh, that was after Vietnam? That was after Vietnam. Uh -huh. I, uh, while I was in the military, I went to college. And I finally ended up, I graduated from the University of Hawaii with a, a degree in criminal justice. And the Chinook is a very large helicopter. It's the largest one. Uh, the Army has. 
So when I was assigned to the 25th Infantry in Hawaii, uh, the Chinooks were too large to be placed at Schofield Barracks. Uh, so the Chinook Company of the 25th Aviation Battalion was stationed on a naval air station, Barbers Point Naval Air Station in Hawaii. And we were the only Army company on the Navy base. The Army had an inter-service agreement to provide one person to the uh, military police in the, in the Navy. And being that I had uh, a degree in criminal justice, they decided uh, so let me work as a criminal investigator. And I did that for the entire time uh, I was in uh, Hawaii. What kind of investigations did you see in Hawaii? We, we did <clears throat> all investigations were, that were felonies or crimes committed against the Navy. Okay. Were you pretty, were you pretty busy? Yes, the there was only uh, six investigators for the whole base and uh, we were required to be on 24-hour duty every third day. So we usually got called out in the middle of the night. Yeah. Now moving back uh, back some years uh, into Vietnam, uh, did you see any comet when you were over there? Oh yeah. I, uh, I flew approximately 250 combat hours, received uh, nine, nine air medals for that, and I, and I had a, a tenth air medal with a V device for heroism when we were shot down. Uh, Halloween morning, 1969, we were shot down. What happened? We received uh, enemy fire at 2,000 feet. Uh -huh. And the Chinook is one of the few aircraft that you cannot control without hydraulics. So we just spun around with the wind we hit the ground, the aircraft commander was uh, killed instantly. Uh, his name was Paul Getz from Tennessee, he had five daughters, and if it wasn't for his experience, I probably wouldn't be here today, because very few people ever lived through a Chinook crash. Uh -huh. Where were you positioned in the, in the aircraft? Well, the as the flight engineer. I, you know, just walked around the aircraft inside and checked everything visually. And uh, when, we, when we got hit and started spinning, I grabbed onto the seat and just held on. Yeah. And then when we crashed, I was uh, temporarily knocked out. My helmet was ripped off. My gun was missing, my pistol. I was, I was bleeding in the face, over my eyes. I didn't know, but I had two broken knees at the time and my left arm. And I walked out of the aircraft, it was on, on fire. Uh, they told me they didn't know how I got out of the aircraft because the aircraft crashed across a ravine. And uh, I guess I jumped, I don't, I don't know. And I was walking away from the aircraft kind of stunned going into shock and I realized I had no pistol uh, and no one else was around, the aircraft was in fire, so I said, well, I'll just go back and I heard the uh, assistant pilot, he was kind of screaming and he had broken both of his legs, which is common in, an, in a helicopter crash. Uh -huh. uh, so I helped pull him out. Was he still in his in a He was in his seat. seat. He was in his seat. We, uh, I, I helped um, buckle him, and we lifted him out. And I was no more than a f two feet away from the aircraft commander, and I never, never saw him. I, I don't know why. I'm sure I was bumping into him, but I never did see him. He was uh, pretty well messed up. Yeah. And uh, so <clears throat> shortly after, we had air support in the air that uh, was fantastic. We had, 
I don't know how many aircraft flying around us in support. While we were, we were spinning around going down, I did notice there was people in the jungle area running around and I didn't know who they were. Fortunately, it was the uh, United States Army and they, they uh, put a protective uh, safety net around us until okay. the air support came. And then I was flown into, uh, I was dusted off uh, and flown into a, I think it was the 74th Medical Evacuation Company. Now besides the, uh, the, uh, the captain dying, I guess, and the pilot, were there any other casualties in the ship? Oh yeah, all of us were injured. Uh, like I said, the assistant pilot had two broken legs. Uh, my crew chief, my old crew chief, had a broken back. I was training a new crew chief that day. He ended up with, I think that was a, just a, a slight bruiser caught on his left shoulder. And the gunner ended up with a M60 barrel through his chest. Now, could you tell me about a couple of your most memorable experiences while in Vietnam, well, or in the military in general? Vietnam is something you don't forget. I mean, uh, there were things that were going on all the time, and you know, sometimes you, you remember them, remember them all the time. Sometimes, you know, they, you know, they flow in and out of your brain. Uh, a lot of the artillery at night uh, kept us up. We were, we were uh, mortared almost every night in, in the complex, in the enemy. Uh, the maintenance hooch was hit one night and all of the cooks were injured. Really? So we had to, we, they asked for volunteers for cooks. and. Uh, I don't know, they seem to have better food after that. <laughs> but the food was good. We got all fresh food over there. That's good. So you had fresh milk? Yeah, we had fresh yeah. milk, we had fresh meat and vegetables. That's good. Now, when you were airlifted out and, uh, and, and dusted off what was it, by the 74th Menevac Company, where did, where did they take you to? To the 74. To the 74. Yes. And then, from how long were you were you there for? I was only there a short time. Uh, unfortunately, they had uh, local Vietnamese as assisting in the hospital area, and they they uh, I don't know. If, I was partially in shock at that time, but I recall that they washed my wounds off, and then they put paper tape around my knees right over the, the open flesh wounds and uh, and then I was flown back to my company area and they brought me on a stretcher to my uh, living quarters and I guess I fell asleep I don't know I woke up and my knees were blown up like balloons and the pain was unbelievable yeah so there was a hooch, hooch made in the, in the area, and I told him to go get the first sergeant. He came over, he looked at me, and he walked out, and he called the uh, the local dispensary, which is actually uh, like a 10-bed hospital uh -huh. in, in, in Bearcat. So uh, the ambulance took me there, and I stayed there for almost three weeks. They ripped off the tape, which was not fun, and I ended up with a cast on both both legs and my left arm. Well, how long were you out of commission for? I well, <clears throat> I didn't I didn't go back to, as a crew member. Uh -huh. uh, usually, you, they don't let you fly again if you, if you lost consciousness or anything like that. So I was uh, that happened. Uh, uh, I'd say Halloween morning, uh -huh. sixty nine. And I, uh, I stayed there almost till November. Oh, well, I mean uh, the end of November. Mm -hmm. In December, January, February, uh, 
I, I was in charge of the NCO club. And then after February, were you sent back home? I was sent back home the end of February, and that's when I was sent to Fort Carson. First, I had a 52-day convalescent leave at home, and then I was sent to Fort Carson, Colorado. So you went back home to New Britain? Yes. Now, when, when the Chinook went down at, and you realized that you were out in the field unarmed, were you worried about being you know, captured as prisoners sure. of war? Sure, sure. Yeah. Especially that I seen people running around in the jungle. I didn't know who they were. Yeah. And that's probably one of the reasons that I went back to the aircraft. Because you realized that the perimeter was secure? Yeah, well, yeah. I didn't know at that time it was secure. Mm -hmm. and in fact, I didn't know until I got out of the hospital. Yeah. Were there anybody else, you know, uh, within your, uh, your unit that was captured by, by the Vietnamese? Yeah. I don't believe we had any POWs in our unit. Can you tell me about uh, uh, if you were awarded, or I know you were awarded that, you know, in the medals and citations, but can you, can you tell me a little bit more about, about them? Yeah. Well, the Army awards you an air medal for every 25 combat flight hours. Wow. And not every mission is, is listed as a uh, camp combat hours. Wow. Uh, some of them listed as a support hours or you fly some food out to in the landing zone or some ice out or some beer out or something like that, you know, food. Wow. And uh, like I said, I got about 250 combat hours. Mm -hmm. We were actually flying into uh, 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 enemy, well, enemy territory was basically all over Vietnam. Uh, we didn't have any friendly lines per se. Mm -hmm. But uh, we, we flew into hot LZs. One, one instance, we flew into LZ Rock and it was receiving artillery and enemy fire from three different sides. Mm -hmm. And we flew in to extract the people there. And of course, we flew into a side that wasn't the open side. It was one of the sides we were seeing the enemy fire. That worked out okay. I guess we got a few rounds in the aircraft. Yeah. Of course, we always inspect after we do a mission, you know, and find some holes here and there. That's happened several occasions. Yeah. What were they using to uh, to fire at the aircraft? Oh, they. They fired anything they could get their hands on at the aircraft. Uh, uh, they they also had a, a unique uh, system where they pull a pin on a on a grenade and then run tape around the grenade to hold the handle in place. And they had it down to a to a science where they they knew how long it would take for the they dropped the, the grenade in their fuel tanks. And they knew how long it would take to disintegrate the tape, so they would they would uh, wrap enough uh, times around the grenade. So when we were getting up in the morning and, and prepping for flights, that's when the grenade went off, and they put out a few of our aircraft that way. Now uh, we're going to talk a little a little bit more about. Um, your service here. Um, on a better note, how did you stay in touch with your family? I wrote letters. And uh, can you tell me a little bit more about the food? You said after after the kitchen staff was taken out, it actually got better. It did. Yeah. Uh, the food, like I say, was was fresh. Uh, they always being in the in the flight status, we usually came home after the, the normal uh, food hours. Or dining hours, but they always kept warm food for the uh, flight crews, no matter what time we came back. And we actually had a, a guy who was a baker in our company, and the other companies in the battalion didn't have that. Get fresh bread or whatever. You made fresh pastries. Pastries, huh? Yeah, definitely. What was the best pastry that you made? What was the I, I like the, the, the fresh bread myself. Yeah, yeah. Now, did you have plenty of supplies uh, you know, while you were in the service? We, we had, like, personal supplies and food and things like that. It was no problem. 
Uh, the biggest problem in Vietnam was parts. Parts for the Chinook. Yeah. What parts were, were most parts were difficult to get in? Were they on short supply? Or? No, not not most. The engines were short supply, rotor blades. Uh, like I said, uh, we'd fly on conditions that were considered a red X condition. Yeah. And we would not fly it in the, in the states. But being in combat, you know, if something ended up being a red X condition and you're out in the field per se, mm -hmm. you know, we want to get home. Yeah. Or at least out of the area, for sure. Yeah. Um, especially, you know, if there was an enemy in the area, which we normally would know that. Yeah. And the Vietnamese, the, the uh, Viet Cong, they received, I don't know, high praise or some kind of reward if they shot down an aircraft. And of course, the bigger the aircraft, the bigger the reward. Yeah. And being that the Chinook was the biggest, you know, they'd, they'd always gone for us. Yeah. Then do you do you question why they um, they were short in supplies? Do you think it was just you know supply and demand, or I believe it was supply and demand. I didn't know at the time. Yeah. You know, the uh, supply system. I wasn't familiar with it, but uh, I always figured that you know. It, there's a lot of companies over there, and a lot of parts are interchangeable on helicopters. So I, I just thought it was a yeah. lack of supply for that reason. Were there a lot of Chinooks over in, uh, in Vietnam? Yeah. yeah. A, a normal uh, complement of aircraft in, in an Army aviation company is normally 16. Mm -hmm. And you, you strive to keep, uh, you know, a certain percentage of them up and flying every day. Yeah. Uh, that was pretty difficult over there. In the States, uh, I believe the uh, requirement was tr to try to keep 80% of your, your staff uh, aircraft flying. Uh, it was a little easier then. But over there, I don't know, there'd be times that certainly more than half the aircraft were we're down for maintenance. Yeah. Now, did you feel pressure or stress at all? Sure. Yeah. Uh, if you're a flight status, we flew five days a week, no, excuse me, six days a week. And then on Sunday, we usually do maintenance. Uh, normally, if you were in, in a flight status and, and you flew in Vietnam, you would, uh, you probably you would log somewhere between three and five thousand hours in a year. And if you, if you were in the States, you probably wouldn't get that in a 20 year you know, span. So it's a lot of flight time. Definitely. Yeah. We'd go out before sun up with a flashlight to the flight line and come home with a flashlight. Wow, to be out all day. Oh yeah, that's been tiring. Definitely, but you you got used to it, you know, and uh, it made the time go by. Right. Now, was there something that you did, you know, for for good luck at all? Good luck. Yeah. Oh yeah, I carried a, a St. Joseph's medal around my neck. Now, how do people uh, entertain themselves over and on? Well, in our fire support base, Bearcat, we uh, the company would bring in entertainment groups. Uh -huh. the, U with the USO? Not necessarily the USO, local entertainment uh, from Vietnam, and we had some from Australia, you know, uh -huh. be singing and dancing. And, the comedians answer. yeah they were pretty good Australians for sure were mm -hmm. and some of the locals were pretty good now what did you do when you were on leave I went personally I went to Hawaii uh -huh. and I went to Australia is there any particular reason why you chose those destinations well Hawaii uh, truthfully when I went there you were not allowed to go home when you're in Vietnam. Later on, 
if you were stationed in Vietnam, they did allow you to go home on leave. Yeah. But when I was there, they didn't allow you. But I, I, I went to Hawaii with the intention of, if I thought I could get away with it, I would fly home. Yeah. Which I did. Yeah. And there was no problem. Australia, I figured I'd, I probably would never get there as a civilian. Uh -huh. And I was glad I went. To Australia? Yes. Did you have a good time though? Yeah, it was very good. They had a program called the, I think it was called the Persina program, where they had local girls, I guess they interviewed them and they allowed them to go on dates with the soldiers, you know? Yeah. And uh, I ended up uh, with a school teacher. Her name was Noella Parks. She was from Bankstown, which is adjacent to Sydney. And, and you know, we went out to dinner and they have a restaurant, which I have a picture of. Uh, so I think it's 400 feet above sea level and it rotates around. Oh, really? Yeah. That's pretty cool. Yeah, it was. And uh, we had a good time. Yeah. Now, when you were in Hawaii, you said you, you, you were able to make it home? Oh, yeah. yeah. Well, how long were you home for? What was it oh, like? Maybe seven days. Well, when I got home, nobody was home. Well, yeah. Of course, I didn't tell them I was coming. And then I happened to notice on a table, my mother had left an invitation to a wedding, which happened to be my uh, first cousin. Uh -huh. So I went to the wedding and I walked in. <laughs> they must have been shocked. They were. They yeah. were. Were you in civvies? No, I was in uniform. Yeah. Because I flew, I had to fly in uniform. And yeah. I'm certainly not going to take, uh, you know, a bunch of stuff on, on leave. Yeah. So I went in uniform and it was it was a shock. Yeah. It was fun. It was good. You know, uh, I guess they didn't want you to go home because you probably wouldn't want to go back. Uh -huh. But I didn't mind it. I kind of like flying and you know, helping people. Yeah. Is there anywhere else that you travel while on the service besides uh, back to uh, Hawaii and Australia? Uh, that was when I was strictly in Vietnam, those two oh. places. But uh, oh, I traveled a lot of places. Uh, I was stationed in a lot of places. Oh. I'm, you know, on a long weekend or a four-day weekend or something, the younger guys, they'd go to the local gin mill, you know, and yeah. they put on the leave papers that they were going to be stationed at. Uh, one place was called the Cow Palace in uh, down at Fort Campbell, Kentucky. And, you know, they put that down for a leave address. And some of the kids stayed there, you know, uh, or they didn't actually sleep there, but they went back and forth every day and yeah. just drank. You know, I was, I don't know, I was, I, I was older. I grew up a heck of a lot when I left Vietnam. And, and I wouldn't do that. I, you know, I, I remember one time I was stationed at uh, Fort Campbell, Kentucky, and I actually drove out to Fort Sill, Oklahoma mm -hmm. on a four-day weekend to see some friends of mine out there. So, were they service friends? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Now, do you recall many particularly humorous uh, or an unusual event that occurred? Oh, there was probably many of them. I had a a friend. I made a friend in basic training. Uh -huh. uh, this gentleman was from uh, New Jersey at the time, and he had just gotten married before he enlisted, and uh, we ended up going to Chinook School together. And uh, at the end of Chinook School, I think it was within a day, either before or after. He graduated. His daughter was born, uh -huh. and um, we ended up in the same battalion, 25th Aviation Battalion. Uh, excuse me, was it the 25th? 228th, I think it was. I think it was.
two, yeah, two twenty eighth Aviation Battalion. Okay. Yeah, that was the one in Vietnam. Uh, and I was in Company A, and he was uh, in Charlie Company, which was about a hundred miles away from us. So, uh, anyways, he ended up there, and I ended up in Bearcat. He ended up in a place called Fook Ven. And uh, we saw each other once or so. Uh, I guess he flew down when, when I was in the hospital and visited me. And we became pretty good friends. And uh, when we left Vietnam, we both got assigned to Fort Carson, Colorado. And unfortunately, Fort Carson did not have any Chinooks in it. So we we did. Uh, I ended up being a company armor in the uh, it was a mechanized infantry unit. Thanks, and I can't recall the name of the unit. But I was there, and he he had his and brought his wife and child with him from New Jersey when he went out to Fort Carson. And he was a kind of a guy that it was hard to wake up in the morning. So when we processed into uh, the reception center, uh, that usually took a day or two, and then they, they assigned you to a company. Well, I was assigned to one, he was assigned to another, and the company he was assigned to had over 400 people in it. Normally, an aviation company, pilots and, and enlisted usually was like 125 in that range. And this company had 400 or so. And that was because of Vietnam, I guess, was winding down a little bit. And they had people, uh, you know, stepping over each other. They had assigned jobs uh, like 24-hour uh, fire watch on your barracks, and then you're off the rest of the week type thing. Yeah. Well, he processed into the reception center and then he got assigned to this unit and he went he signed into the unit signed into the mail room so he'd get his mail he, of course he lived off base in the apartment and then the next day he didn't wake up in time so he said oh, I'll go in tomorrow well tomorrow stretched out past 30 days and at that point if you're AWOL for 30 days you're considered a deserter yeah. And, he, and that's the first thing that went through his mind. Uh, fortunately, the company did not know he was missing because they had so many people in there. And it stretched out to almost five months. And he was missing. But he received his check every day, every, no. every month, because he signed into the mail. Did so he show back up? Yeah. What happened was we were getting... Oh, getting towards our uh, uh, discharge date. So he says, well, I got to face the music now. Yeah. So he, he, you know, he asked me, he says, would you, uh, you know, look after my wife and kid if, you know, I end up in prison. I said, of course. You know, I used to take his daughter, because he was afraid to go out of his apartment, technically. I used to take his daughter you know, to the playground, and we got pretty well attached. Uh, I used to take her out a lot, yeah. and I take his wife shopping or something. You know, but then he ended up he had to go back in sooner or later, so he did. And he said, he told me, he said, well, he walked in the first sergeant's office. He says, I'm here. And they looked at him, who are you? Just for. <laughs> It was, it was really luck on his part, and, and that's all it was, it was luck. From the time he first signed into the company yeah. to the time he walked back in five months later, there was a, a company commander change and a first sergeant change. Yeah. So they certainly didn't know. No. 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 They gave him an Article 15, <clears throat> and the punishment was a hundred days of extra duty huh. and he never served the day <laughs> they made him the male the male man in the company yeah and he never served the day of extra duty 
And did he still show up for? Oh, he was also fined a hundred dollars a month for three months, and he could he put it to a contribution of his choice. Yeah. And uh, normally that's obviously a court martial offense. Yeah. But he he probably could have got away with nothing if if he pressed it because the first. The first step of being AWOL is the company's got to know and they got to report you AWOL. Yeah, and they would look like a fool. Yeah. You know? <laughs> if they brought it any higher than that. So, but he made out okay. And I, uh, I talked to him and his wife and his daughter now, who's approximately, I would say, 42. Wow. And, uh, I talked to him on email or Facebook every every other day or something. Yeah. Yeah. Was there a reason why he, he didn't he didn't show up? He he was just tough to get out of bed. Yeah, he really was. You have to yeah. put a bomb under him to wake him up. You know. Yeah. And then when, like I say, a, a week went by, and then he was nervous, and then thirty days, then yeah, he says, I I, you know, I might as well stay out now. And he really lucked out, though. Right? He, oh, yeah. I never heard of it. Yeah. Well, another time I recall where uh, everybody kind of lucked out. We, when we left Fort Eustis after uh, Chinook School, we went to Fort Sill. And we were put into what they call a packet company. Uh -huh. It was the 19th Aviation Company. It wasn't a real company. It was a packet, which means that they were building up, building up this company. And they were going to go to Korea. Uh, the guys were slowly coming in. Uh, most of the guys from my uh, Chinook school ended up out there in Fort Sill, and we had some other people uh, who had different a uh, different job. You know, they came from different schools into the company. What year was this? This was in uh, 1969. 69. No, well, first it was 68. Yeah, November 68, we were yeah. building up, and uh, we went out to Fort Sill, and, and my buddy and I, the one uh, that I just told you about, we ended up in the cadre rooms in the front of the barracks. These were all World War II barracks, uh -huh. and they had a broken window in it, and this was November, out in Fort Sill. It was windy as heck yeah. and cold, so we hung a blanket over this window. And uh, our responsibility after we signed into the post, our responsibility was to go to a formation uh, across the street and, and stand formation in a, the 154th Aviation Company. That was an established company. And they were, they were having an IG inspection at the time, you know, a, a week or two week inspection. So they didn't want to be bothered with us, you know. They didn't take any head counts or anything. We went to the formation, and after formation, we went back to processing the post or whatever. Well, we didn't go to the formations. <laughs> we slept all day, and around four o'clock, we got up and we went downtown, and played pool, and yeah. drank beer all evening, and we went back. We did the same thing. Well. Uh, when we first got there, like I said, it was a broken window. So we put a request in to have it fixed, naturally. Well, it was probably uh, December sometime they fixed it. So we came home. Like three weeks. Oh, oh, easy. <laughs> it could have been later. But uh, anyway, so we came home from one of our drunken evenings, and we had locked our keys. And this is the same day they fixed the window. We locked our keys in our room. <laughs> so we broke the window again. <laughs> How long was it broken for them? Oh, it was, it was broke until we left. <laughs> and uh, anyways, uh, we finally got up to a, a status where we were ready to move over to Korea. And one morning, it was just before Christmas, we had a formation in uh, Another unusual thing was we had a, a warrant officer as acting company commander oh. and a spec six as acting first sergeant. And a warrant officer at that time were not commissioned. They couldn't hold the yeah. commander's 
in a slot. And the first sergeant was not a spec six, the same thing as a staff sergeant. Yeah. But they were acting. So they called us in the formation one day, and they called out a bunch of names in the formation. They said, you guys go in the supply room, and we'll talk to you. We went in there, and he said, well, I don't know how to tell you, but I'm just going to come right out and tell you. You guys are going to Vietnam. You're not going to Korea. We didn't care. We were young and dumb, 18 years old. Yeah. Uh, 19 years old. Army never sent you into combat unless you were 19. I don't know if that's changed. But, uh, anyway, uh, we all went home on leave. And it was a snowy winter. And I couldn't get back because of the snow out of Bradley Field. We were, you know, locked in for a while. So I came back like 10 days late. And I walked into the company and I seen this acting for a sergeant. I said, well, you know, I'm 10 days late. Well, did they say anything in your order room? Tell them that you told me and I must have forgot about it. Yeah. yeah. So uh, I did. I told him, I said, I talked to the first sergeant. And I never heard anything again until I got discharged in 1971. And they questioned you on that? They took back the money for 10 days. Oh, <laughs> and we're only making, when I went to Vietnam, I was a uh, private first class. We were making $153 a month. A month? A month. Wow. Oh, when I was in basic, it was $95 a month. I was making 153 plus we had combat pay. I think it was 65 And uh, I, I had flight status, and it was 55 for that, too. Yeah. And of course, this was all tax free. So it was a lot of money. Yeah. Uh, compared to today. Like I said, yeah. when I went in, it was $95. Today, it's over 1000 yeah. for a guy that's in basic. And the living expenses and food and stuff's all taken care of. So yeah. you should be able to save a little bit of that. I lived on $40 a month really? in Vietnam. And so I didn't need it. You know, I mean, soap, toothpaste. Yeah. We weren't allowed uh, to buy any liquor unless you were an E6 or above. So it wasn't easy to obtain, though? E6. Oh. Yeah, because uh, we had, like the EM club, they had beer, and I, I think they had liquor in there, too. Yeah. But of course, you weren't supposed to drink unless you were 21. Even though the drinking age at the time was 18? I don't know, was it at that time? I think so. I don't remember. Yeah, I think they changed it uh, after Vietnam. Or maybe it, maybe it was around, maybe it was 21. I, I'm not I sure. Mistaken. I, I'm not sure. So if you weren't in V6, you couldn't buy it? Not in Vietnam, no. What was your rank, your highest rank in Vietnam? In Vietnam, I was a Spec 5. Spec 5? Especially the Buck Sergeant. Yeah. Okay. And that was the normal rank. That you'd make in three years if you were halfway on the ball. Yeah. E6 was the hardest rank to make. Yeah. It really is. And then after that, seven, eight, and nine, you would you're promoted by Washington D.C. Mm -hmm. You know, a uh, uh, promotion board. Yeah. They'd look at your records. They wouldn't look at you. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. they'd look at your records and you get promoted right. according to your records. Right. I got when I got E6, I got. Uh, <clears throat> I got promoted. They waived half the time for my time in grade and half the time for time in service. The average E6 was 10 years in the military. Yeah. I made it in uh, five years. Yeah. It was, yeah. Now, looking back, were there ever any pranks that you or others would pull on each other? I don't know, past time or any jokes? Jeez, I'm sure it was. Am I ready in particular? I can't seem to put my finger on anything right now. You're talking over 40 years ago. I mean, there had to be. Uh, yeah. Oh, I remember. <laughs> when I got assigned to Fort Carson, Colorado after Vietnam, yeah. company clerk was from Connecticut. So right away we became buddies. And uh, he was getting 
either discharged or he was going home on leave, I can't recall. And we were sitting in the cafeteria having a coffee, and he said, geez, it'd be nice if you could come home with me. I said, yeah, I would. Well, we had a second lieutenant, Butterball, as a commander, company commander, you know, he was ROTC, uh, you oh, know, okay. college dude. Yeah. Uh, wasn't really military, per se. So, you know, I says to him, I says, okay, I'll go home with you. He says, how are you going to do that? I said, don't worry about it. So I went in the, the orderly room, and I got a leave paper, and I filled it out. And the company commander, he was coming in from the battalion headquarters, walking in the door, and I said, sir, I says, I got to go home on leave. Said, what for? I said, my grandmother died. I think everybody's grandmother died a half a dozen yeah, yeah, yeah. times or so. <laughs> did he question? He did. Oh, he said, uh, no, I'm not signing that. I said, well, I'm telling you right now, I'm going anyhow. <laughs> and I was one of the few Vietnam veterans in that company at the time. So you'd already seen, this is in Colorado, right? So yeah. So, you know, I had a lot of experience with the military, and he obviously knew it. I was the most decorated buck sergeant in the company. I had made company soldier of the month in that company. I made the battalion soldier of the month. And then I went to discom and made soldier of the month. So wow. He knew I had experience. Did he respect? Did he respect he did, he that? did, he did. Yeah. And uh, so he signed it. Good. <laughs> so, he didn't ask for an obituary on it. No, no, no. Like I said, he wasn't really military per se. I yeah, mean, yeah, yeah. he tried hard. He was an administrative guy. With me. He was. He was. Yeah. He was a very nice guy. His name was Johnson. I can't remember his first name. Yeah. Did he ever serve in country? Do you know? I don't think so. No. It's stateside. Yeah. Now you had some photographs. Were you able to take a lot of photographs when you were over? I was. Yeah. That's good. Um, now, we were talking about officers a little bit. What, what did you think about you know other officers uh, and your fellow soldiers? We had a tight group. Yeah. We looked out for each other. Uh, when you serve in a, in, in a combat zone, you, you always seem to have a, a more of a uh, brotherly uh, or a family closeness than you do in the stateside. Yeah. You know, stateside, you go to work every day in the military, and, you, and after work at four o'clock or whatever, you go home or you go to your barracks and do whatever you want to do. In the, in the combat zone, at the end of the day, whatever time it is, you're back with the same guys again. It's not like you can go down the corner store or you know, go to the bowling alley or anything. I mean, you didn't have any of that. Except in Tatsunu, which was Air Force, they always seemed to have the best of everything. <clears throat> it was was it budget budgetary or was this kind of luck of the draw for those guys? Uh, the Air Force? Yeah, they had a bigger budget. Ah, uh, I don't know. They they treated their people a little differently than us. Uh huh. Uh, they always seemed to have. Uh, for instance, in, when I was stationed in Hawaii, I was also stationed at. Uh, Wheeler Air Force Base for a while uh, in Hawaii, and I was Air Force. And uh, the enlisted folks, they had like condominiums for, for barracks. On base? Yeah, yeah. Uh, they had uh, the sleeping quarters on each side of a common living area, which would be a living room, TV, and they shared a bathroom. And you know, the Army, we had rooms, of course I was, I, I got married in Hawaii, but uh, we had uh, the barracks, the guys had uh, maybe four people into a room, a bunk beds type thing, you know. Yeah. I mean, they didn't have the, uh, the excess uh, comforts. That the, yeah. Air, the Air Force had, well, probably the Navy. I don't know about the Navy that much. Yeah, didn't climb as <laughs> Yeah. Oh, yeah. That was back in 1976. Wow. I guess today they're much better though. I don't 
my son's. I went, my son is in the Air Force Reserve. Oh yeah. How long has he been in for? I think two years. Yeah. Maybe two years. This September, two or three years. I can't remember for sure. Does he? Does he like what he's doing? Yeah, he's uh, avionics. Uh, Warfare, warfare detection devices on the C-5A, mm -hmm. and we had, uh, well, I shouldn't say we, because we didn't have Blackhawks in Vietnam, but on the, on the Blackhawks today, they have what they call a chaff system. You know, they're getting fired on with a, by a missile or something, they'd shoot off this chaff. And now we deflect the uh, rockets, and, uh, uh, and that's the only thing we have on the Black Hawks. And I could talk extensively on Black Hawks too, but uh, there's something I think he said there's like 14 different devices on a C5. Really? Yeah. 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 He's in charge of, of maintaining those yeah. devices. Yeah, maintaining yeah. them and. Wow. Inspecting them, repairing them. Pretty sophisticated. It is. It's, it's one of the hardest schools uh, in the Air Force. Wow. I mean, they had a class of, I want to say six. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> That's pretty pretty elite division if you want. It really is. Yeah. I flew down to Texas when he graduated from this school. And he went to school for like two years. Two year program? Yeah, so it must be three years in September. Wow. Well, I include basic, you know, two. Yeah. Two months there, and, and I flew down to Texas, and uh, I drove down there. And they pinned his weird wings on him. Yeah, yeah. Now, when you were in the service, did you keep a personal diary? At all? I did not. No. So we're going to talk a little bit about your, uh, you know, uh, life after the service. Do um, you recall the day your service ended? Yeah. When was it? What, what year? I got I got discharged uh, June 16, uh, 1980. 1980. Uh -huh. California. So you were in California. What yeah. whereabouts in uh, California? It was uh, I guess it's considered San Francisco. Uh, San Fort Ord. I think it was Fort Ord. Fort what? Ord. Ord. O -O -R -D. Oh, okay. Well, what did you do in the uh, in the days and the weeks afterward? Well. Like I say, I came from Hawaii, so I had shipped my car, and that was waiting for me. And my household goods, I wouldn't get them probably for another month after that. Uh -huh. uh, but we drove, and like I say, I got married in uh, in Hawaii. My wife was attending uh, University of Hawaii, and as I was, and uh, we got married, and we drove to. Uh, on the way back to Connecticut, we drove to her home in Kansas. Oh, so she's originally from Kansas? Yeah. And she was attending college out in uh, Hawaii. So at this time, you were both had your undergraduate? Yeah. Or your, your bachelor's degree? Yes. Yeah. So you, on the way back, you stopped at Kansas? Yes. Or, uh, yeah, we were there about a week, I guess, and then we continued on mm -hmm. to Connecticut. And that's where you guys settled? Yeah. After. We had. We had two kids in, in Hawaii. Yeah. So uh, you went back to to uh, to school that was supported by the uh, GI Bill. When, when you were back in school. What? When, when I was back in the states. Yeah. Yeah. I w I went to school under the rehabilitation program from the VA. Uh huh. And they reimbursed you. Yeah. yeah. Hey, can you tell me a little bit more about the you know any close relationships that you made while while in the service? And you really tell me about uh, a couple of the Did you maintain any of those? Uh, the one in New Jersey, I did. Uh, now I was also in the National Guard when I got out, and uh, I've got quite a few friends from there still. Yeah. Uh, most of them are retired from the guard now, but uh, in fact, I had uh, lunch with one yesterday. Uh huh. He's a, he lives in, in the area. In Newington. In Newington. Yeah. Um, have you joined any uh, veterans organizations? I'm a, I have been a member of Disabled American Vets, the VFW. 
and American Nugent. Now, what did you go on uh, doing for uh, for work for a career after after the war? Well, let's see. Uh, when I first got home, actually, I had lined it up before I got home. Being that I had a family now, you know, I you had I, kids at the time when you were traveling back. Yeah. Well, how there, many kids did you have? I have two kids that were born in Hawaii. Wow. Okay. And my daughter was uh, six weeks old. I was supposed to get out in February of '80, but my wife. Uh, was due in April with our daughter, uh -huh. so uh, I requested an extension until I was hoping to get a six-week checkup done. Yeah. And uh, what the Army did, they extended me from February until June. That's great. So it was actually more than six weeks. Yeah, yeah I was surprised. Yeah. Uh, and my son was born 14 months before. But uh, when I first got out, like I said, I had lined up a job while I was in Hawaii. And I worked as a security guard at the uh, uh, the East Hampton uh, nuclear power plant. Uh -huh. And at the time, it was great. They had paid full medical for my family. Yeah. And the, and the pay wasn't bad, but of course, I had to get something better, you know. Yeah. So I ended up, I went to the state, I was a state police protective officer. Okay. And from there I went to the post office, and I became a postal police officer. Okay. And then... I decided I wanted to try my own business. And I went into house painting. Uh -huh. And that was great, except I had no benefits. Yeah. So you buy your own insurance. Yeah. Okay. So I decided, let me get back into the government. Yeah. So I became a full time aircraft mechanic at Bradley Field uh -huh. with the uh, Army National Guard. Uh, which I did before I went in. As a civilian? Yeah. Yeah. Here you were working on base? Yes. What was that like? What were you working on? What, what, what? Uh, we had UEs, UH-1s. Uh-huh. How long did you do that for in Bradley Field? About five months. Five months. And I applied uh, to the Department of Defense uh, as an aircraft inspector, which I got. Uh -huh. And I ended up at uh, um, right across from Bradley Field as a factory, Hamilton Standard. At, at that uh -huh. time, it was Hamilton Standard, it's not now Hamilton Sunstrand. And I was there for about just about a year, mm -hmm. and I transferred down to Sikorsky Aircraft. Okay, so from Longford, outside of Longford. Stratford. Stratford. Yeah. Well, the main plant's in Stratford. Yeah. And uh, I had the program, I was the Army representative for the Black Hawk program worldwide. Really? Yeah. That's pretty cool. It was. I uh, actually signed bill of sales for the Blackhawks. Wow. You know, to the tune of seven something million piece. That's, a, that's unbelievable. And yeah. this was all as a civilian? Yeah. So you were representing the army? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, my boss was the, a colonel down in uh, Redstone Arsenal uh -huh. in Alabama. And I ended up, I had three offices <laughs> one at Stratford. One in Shelton and one in Bridgeport. Oh, wow. And I did that until 2002 when I retired with a total of 30 years, including military. Yeah. So I've been retired just about 10 years. I retired at 52. Yeah. That's good. You've been enjoying the uh, retiree life? Yeah, I am. Yeah. That's great. Yeah. Now, uh, a couple more questions here. Did your military experience influence your thinking about, you know, about the military? 
um, uh, in general, or you know, about the war and military in general? Yeah, definitely. I uh, I learned to uh, realize it's it's the military is a way of life, more so than a job, yeah. and they take care of their own, and. Uh, it's it's a decent job if you keep your nose clean i mean you can put in 20 30 years and have a decent retirement yeah. whereas it's really tough out there today yeah it's tough to have out there. my son was unemployed when he got off of active duty in august last august he just got a job like two weeks ago yeah. and he got, he got a job went to work on a friday and monday they laid him off Wow. And uh, he, he got a job the following Monday with the same company, only he's, he's an IT guy uh, in one of the Springfield hospitals. Yeah. Yeah. You think he's going to get called back in eventually? Well, he's still in the yeah. reserves now. Yeah, yeah. So he goes once a month. Right, right. I wish he would tell you the truth. Uh, you know, you got a guaranteed check coming in and medical you can't argue with the medical yeah, yeah definitely. and he has a daughter now how old's his daughter she was born last october 4th i don't know six months oh, congrats. seven months six months is that your only grandchild no my daughter has a uh a, a, a boy and a girl oh, wow. my granddaughter just turned 10 and my grandson will be Six uh, next month. Uh huh. <laughs> yeah. They are. They're, they're great. I see them every day. Yeah. So they live right in the area. Yeah. Well, we, <laughs> I bought a. When I retired, we. Well, actually, in 1994, my wife. She's always been a uh, VA FHA loan uh, underwriter. Uh huh. For for like 25, 30 years. So. Uh, at the time, Nations Bank down in Charlotte, they recruited her and moved us down there to Charlotte. Charlotte? Yeah. Cost them like 20 Gs to move us. They paid for all the Everything. A trip down there to, for me to see it and her to see the area and everything. And uh, we bought a house down there. And in the meantime, I took six months leave without pay and I couldn't get a job down there I was supposed to have one but there was a big change in the government uh, storefront operations and anyways I couldn't get a job what year was this? 94 94 and uh, so I, I came back January 1st 95 and my wife had to had to give him a year that was the deal yeah. Uh, so she did. Uh, well, they, her and the kids stayed there until June second, I think, '95, and then I went back down, went and back up, and uh, uh, she became an underwriter in, in some local bank up here. Yeah. So uh, then I built a house in Southington, Connecticut. Uh -huh. And then when I retired, we went back to South Carolina. Okay. And uh, I still have a house down there now. Whereabouts? In York. Okay. Right under Charlotte. Yeah. Uh, and that's the area. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I got a six year old cool you know, four bedroom house. That's great. Do you vacation down there a lot? Not so much now. Yeah. Uh, we moved back mainly because of the grandkids. Yeah. And my so. daughter lives in Coventry. Okay. And I live right on the border of Coventry. Yeah, you're right there. Yeah. So that's good though, so you get to see the kids. Right yeah, there. that's we we moved back for that reason, so I figured we might as well move closer to them. That's good. Now, you said you're in some uh, the you know, veterans organizations. Uh, what kind of activities does your uh, poster association have? Well, I'm not that active in any of them. Uh, uh -huh. when I was younger I was. Yeah. Uh, we had a military ball when the particular time I was active and I was the chairman of that. Did you ever have any reunions? No, we haven't had any. Wow. 
A couple more questions here, and uh, that'll pretty much wrap things up. Um, um, how did your service and your experiences um, affect your life? Well, it gave me uh, a lot of experience on aircraft. Uh, it provided me with a, a nice job with my experience. Uh, yeah. Pretty prestigious job. Yeah, that sounds like a cool job. And I also had uh, the presidential program for the CH-53, the Marine uh, CH-53. Yeah. Uh, what was that about? Well, they made six 53s for the, the President's Squadron, and their, their duties were to carry camera crews in the press uh -huh. and, and his limousine. He didn't fly in the CH-53. Oh, yeah. yeah. He didn't fly in the CH-53. He, he flew in the, and he flies in the SH-3 and the, the Black Hawk yeah. uh, derivative of the President. And, uh, uh, the second CH-53 in his program came off the, off the production line. This was in 96. And it crashed on a tarmac in Sikorsky. Huh. May, I want to say May 10th. Test flight? Yeah, it was yeah. in test flight status. What, what happened? Everybody got killed. There were four people killed. And it burnt up to a crisp. And they found out that I, I was coming home from lunch and coming back to work from lunch with my buddy. And I seen all the ambulances and the fire trucks and everything. And I said, what the hell is going on? And I found out that it crashed. Mm -hmm. I had released that aircraft for flight that morning. Oh, jeez. That was one of my jobs. I released the aircraft for the first flights. Well, what 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 have you failed? Well, fortunately, or unfortunately, I was unfortunate the whole thing happened, but it's nothing that I didn't do or, or mechanics. Or it was mechanics, but it wasn't. It was something I couldn't see. It was internal. It was the uh, actually the uh, uh, the swash plate, which just carries the rotors, the blades. Inside of it, there's a big bearing. It's called a bearing, but it looks like a big ring, yeah. and it was made. Uh, was made of, I don't know, a few thousandths too large or something, and as it overheated, right. it was overheated, it expanded, and it locked the loader. So it just stopped it. Yeah, it stopped it, the so blades went flying off, and it dropped. How many feet up were they? Well, they, had, they, were, they were 200 feet, and they requested to go up to 1,000 for radio checks, and as they were going on the way up, it, it stopped. It stopped. Yeah. And normally, there's only... Usually there's only two people on your crown. They had four? They had four that day. That's too bad. Too. It was. So that, that's pretty much it as far as the, uh, the interview goes. But if there's anything else that we didn't cover if you want to mention, you know, you feel free to, to talk about it uh, at this time. Well, I don't know. Like I say, it was over 40 years ago now. Yeah. I got out of the... Uh, I put, I think, nine years in the guard. And I think I was... I think I got out in 1980, uh, which gave me a total of 18 years there. And everybody says, well, why didn't you do two more years? Well, when I was injured in Vietnam and when I got out of the military, uh, I was receiving disability. Yeah. Knees, uh, I ended up with Agent Orange and type 2 diabetes, and I had a double bypass. Which was a, uh, attached to the Agent Orange somehow. Yeah. So I ended up. Initially, they said we'll give you thirty percent disability, but you have to get out of the guard. Yeah. So at that time, thirty percent was kind of a magic number, because at thirty percent, then they would start paying for your dependents. Yeah. And I don't know. It came to three hundred and some odd dollars a month. And I would receive that tax free now or stay in the guard and receive, I think we we're maybe 250 a month yeah. taxable. Yeah. But I couldn't receive a, a pension until I was age 60. Right. So I, said, I took the 30% and I actually now am 100% disabled. Yeah. And uh, 
it's a considerably like 10 pennies more than the 300 pounds. Yeah, that's good. Man. It's tax free. Yeah. All right. Well, I think that that concludes the interview. I want to I want to thank you for your, your time today and, and uh, you for, your, for your service as well. I really appreciate it. And uh, you know, I'm sure everybody else that, that views it will, will uh, do the same. That's it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.